Something that got you major nerd points in the late 90s was overclocking an early Celeron processor, and even more so if you ran them in a dual CPU setup. I previously tried and failed to pull this off, but now I'm looking for revenge. Will the third time be the charm? This is one of those projects that ended up pretty frustrating. To recap, in 1998, Intel released a line of Celeron processors that were supposedly easy to overclock and performed as well as their Pentium 2 counterparts at far lower cost. I found that while the latter was indeed true, claims about easy overclocking were a bit overblown. Then I found that a very niche group of enthusiasts had taken things to the extreme and ran these Celerons in a dual CPU setup, which they weren't designed to do. Of course, I ran into roadblocks while trying to pull this off as well. But I have one more trick up my sleeve, and it involves these. Adapters that let you install Socket 370 processors into Slot 1 motherboards, which were commonly known as Slockets. The era of Slot 1 CPUs didn't actually last all that long, just from 1997 to 99, and the form factor existed primarily as a way for Intel to improve production yields on its Pentium 2 processors. But by 1998, the company had gotten that issue largely sorted, so it started transitioning its CPU lineup to the new Socket 370 package, which was cheaper to manufacture, both for the processors themselves and the motherboards. During the transition period, Intel offered some CPUs in both versions, and I managed to pick up a pair of Celerons in Socket 370 form. These are otherwise the same 300MHz parts with 66MHz bus speed that I'd been tinkering with previously, and supposedly should be just as easily overclockable. In order to use them in my Slot 1 motherboard, I picked up a pair of generic-looking Slockets from eBay for pretty cheap, and got the CPUs dropped in. Cooling was a bit of a concern, since the space around Slot 1 CPUs generally required slimline heatsinks, and I thought the new old stock coolers I bought would be perfect. But I quickly realized my mistake. These won't work at all, and begrudgingly paid way more than I wanted to for a different pair. But these would give me the clearance I needed and clipped into place without much fuss. My testing rig of choice was the machine I built last time, a copper-colored Lian Li case housing a Super Micro motherboard. I pulled out the Pentium 2 CPU and slotted in the Celeron, and the computer fired up just fine. Once I got into Windows, I launched CPU-Z, and interestingly, it knew that there was a PGA or Pin Grid Array processor installed. But the specs otherwise looked identical to the Slot 1 Celerons I'd used previously, so I shut the machine down, to pick up where I left off last time. That is getting two CPUs working in this thing. Intel had intentionally hampered the Celerons from working this way in order to sell more Pentiums, but some clever folks quickly came up with workarounds. The Slot 1 Celerons I had were on loan to me, and I wasn't willing to try the modifications necessary. But these new Socket 370 chips were mine, and I found that it was possible to do the same mods to the Slockets. Worst case scenario, and I screw up, I could buy another Slocket for a lot cheaper than a Slot 1 Celeron 300A, which are going for decent prices these days. But out of curiosity, I wanted to see what would happen if I installed the second processor as is, without any mods. Imagine my surprise when the computer just worked and showed both CPUs. As it turns out, some manufacturers of Slockets got cheeky and baked those multiprocessor modifications right into the design, and I had unknowingly, and luckily, ended up with a pair of these, which had been sold by PC Chips and ECS. The next question was, what kind of performance increase could one expect going from one CPU to two? To answer that, I had to get over another hurdle. While the motherboard detected both processors, Windows 2000 didn't. CPU-Z wasn't any better, and when I checked Device Manager, I got my answer. It was calling the computer a uniprocessor PC. 
I had to reinstall Windows to fix this, as apparently it only checks whether a computer has more than one CPU during the initial setup. But that didn't take too long, and afterwards it was reporting as a multiprocessor PC with two CPU graphs in Task Manager. Everything looked good in PC Mark 2002 as well, so I kicked off a benchmark run. I wasn't expecting exactly double the results of a single processor since there's always some overhead, but it should be substantially faster. So imagine my surprise when the score was just 799, only three points higher than the 796 I got with only one CPU installed. That means PC Mark isn't able to use both processors, despite being capable of detecting them. And that's a theme we'll see again later on. CPU-Z has its own benchmarks which are multiprocessor aware, and they painted the picture I was expecting. A single CPU score of 3.5, with both at 5.8. But synthetic benchmarks are one thing, and actual applications are another, so I fired up Quake 3 Arena. With a GeForce FX 5200 video card, this system's gaming performance bottleneck is the CPU. So at its stock 300MHz, the Celeron pulled off a frame rate of 37.1 in the Quake 3 demo. But that was just using one CPU, and interestingly, that game actually supports multiprocessing. So I ran the demo again, and got a whopping 3.7 more frames per second. Mm, seems like Quake 3 isn't really capable of multiprocessing either. With that, I decided to move on to the other part of this experiment, seeing how far I could overclock these chips. It's been held that an increase of 50%, boosting the 300 MHz version to 450, was quick and easy. My own experience suggests otherwise, with only one CPU out of three I tried previously wanting to go that fast with just a bus speed increase. I hoped these Socket 370 versions would give me better luck, but to hedge my bets, I chose to test them one at a time. On this motherboard, changing the bus speed from 66 MHz to 100 is as simple as removing this jumper. I was excited to see that the system did report a 450 MHz clock speed, but disappointed to find that Windows blue screened while booting. This is a telltale sign that things aren't running stable. Oftentimes, increasing the CPU voltage from its base 2 volts will fix this, but a limitation with this motherboard is it doesn't let you adjust that in software. One potential option would be to switch motherboards. The ABIT BP6 is highly regarded as being very flexible with overclocking and also supports dual Celerons out of the box. But other vintage computing enthusiasts know this too, with prices to match their scarcity. Another choice could be to switch slockets to the ASUS S370DL, which supports multiprocessing and includes a jumper block to adjust CPU voltages. These two, though, are sought after and expensive, and I'd have to find two of them. Instead, I chose Danger. On slot 1 CPUs, it's possible to adjust the voltage by masking off specific contacts on the card edge. The risk is that if done wrong or the masking comes off, you could inadvertently end up with 2.6 volts being sent to the processor, which could be enough to kill it. This trick works with slockets too, so I threw caution to the wind and covered the appropriate contacts with Kapton tape to push the Celeron from 2 volts to 2.2. Hopefully this would be enough. It was not. The BIOS showed the CPU getting 2.17 volts, so I did the mod correctly, but Windows would still blue screen while booting. The fact the machine would post at 450 MHz gave me hope that it was still just a voltage issue, so out the CPU came, and I adjusted the tape for 2.4 volts. I was starting to worry a little, but the system turned on, and the BIOS showed 2.32 volts. But would this finally be enough? Damn. Nope, blue screen again. I knew it wasn't the RAM causing the problem because it was a PC-133 module, so 100 MHz should be no sweat. And furthermore, I had been running this machine with a 450 MHz Pentium 2, and it worked great. I was running out of options though, so I went for broke and taped the contacts for 2.6 volts. The system posted, and I got into the BIOS. 
2.57 volts. Yikes. I held my breath while the system booted, and... Oh, no way! Wow, it actually worked. The machine made it to the desktop, and I confirmed everything in CPU-Z. 450 megahertz on a 100 megahertz bus, and it only took a crazy amount of voltage to do it. Now to find out if I could get lightning to strike twice. I dropped in the second Celeron, overvolted the same way. The system detected it, so at least I hadn't killed it yet, and the voltage in the BIOS reported correctly. The system started to boot, and I saw a glimmer of hope, until... Oh, so close! There's nothing that says both CPUs have to be at the same voltage. And there was no one stopping me from taping the contacts out of frustration on the second Celeron for 2.8 volts and letting her rip. If 2.73 volts doesn't get this to work, nothing will. But of course... Needless to say, I would not be getting both Celerons to overclock to 450 megahertz. I could have bought more CPUs with the hope of finding one that would work, but how many would I have to go through? And I already had reservations about the first CPU. Sure, it worked, but 2.57 volts is a hell of a lot and probably wouldn't leave the system stable for very long. It just didn't make sense to pursue this further. But that doesn't mean overclocking is off the table entirely. I found an option in the BIOS labeled Manufacture setting with some suspiciously generic choices. Some of these had no effect, but choosing Mode 4 got the post screen to say 400 MHz. And to my relief, the system booted. But it turns out 400 MHz was a lie. In reality, the CPUs were running at 374, the results of a 4.5 multiplier on an 83 MHz bus. I guess the splash screen just got confused. I ran PCMark again, even though I knew it would only produce single CPU results. 1002 this time, up from 799. And the quick benchmarks in CPU-Z showed a similar small bump from 3.5 to 3.8, but across both CPUs, it went from 5.8 to 7.5. And the multiprocessor Quake demo shot up by 10 frames per second, from almost 41 to 51.2. Though, amusingly, the game froze right after that. And that speaks a lot to multiprocessing in the late 1990s. It really wasn't a thing for consumer PCs. Windows 95, 98, and ME only ever supported one CPU, which is why I went with Windows 2000 for this build. But that wasn't meant to be a consumer OS, and outside of the server market, multiprocessor-aware software was generally for professional use. Things like 3D modeling, engineering, and scientific tools. If you were using these kinds of programs, it was likely for work, where your employer would have rather bought you a proper workstation than let you go through all these shenanigans and potentially end up with an unstable mess of a computer. The market for people pulling off what I tried to do here was incredibly small, and I'm sure the concept of doing it simply because they could was a major factor. All this malarkey also casts a bit of a shadow on the notion of the early Celerons being amazingly easy to overclock. I'm at only a 20% success rate using stock voltages at this point, and while enthusiast magazines could be breathless at times about how legendary these CPUs were, they did admit that voltage tweaking was often necessary. And as we saw here, sometimes it wasn't possible at all. Some CPUs just couldn't do it. Still, I hope this adventure was entertaining, if not educational. The late 90s were an amazing time for technology, though it's clear that the rose-tinted glasses of memory may sometimes get in the way of historical facts. I'm sure that decades ago, others ran into the exact same roadblocks I did and threw in the towel like I'm doing now. 375 megahertz will just have to be enough. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. Here's another episode you should check out, and as always, thanks for watching.